Lock and Load podcast is sponsored by Lock and Load Firearms, Connecticut's number one rated gun store and pistol permit class on Google. Come check us out, 1573 Meredith Waterbury Turnpike in Southington, Lock and Load Firearms. Lock and Load podcast is also sponsored by Patriot Wear Holsters, custom-made Kydex holsters locally made in Waterbury, Connecticut, www.patriotwearholster.com, and use code LNL podcast for 10% off your purchase. Orders available for shipping or pickup at various locations. Welcome to Lock and Load Podcast. My name is Josh. And I'm Michelle. And we're here to talk to you about Connecticut 2A issues today. Uh, we have a special guest. His name is Attorney Greg Miller, and he's going to give you a little bio about himself to uh, start us off. So, Greg. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here with us. The, uh, I've been doing this for almost 40 years. Uh, I have served as counsel to most of the largest auction houses in the U.S. doing compliance work, many of the largest gun stores, many of the manufacturers, and hundreds and hundreds of individuals over the last 40 years who have found themselves entangled with the law. We work regularly with people in order to resolve those issues, and today we're going to try and go into some of the common things that get people into trouble and how you can avoid having to need my services. <laughs> Definitely. Um, yeah, so today's topic is common mistakes that will get gun owners in Connecticut uh, arrested um, and how not to get arrested. Um, and we're, you know, we're talking to Greg, the kind of the go-to guy about um, hopefully getting you out of those handcuffs. Um, so we're going to go through a slew of topics today um, and um, answer some viewer questions that were submitted to us at the end. And um, go through there to uh, inform you guys of our wonderful, tangled, confusing Connecticut, uh, Connecticut gun laws. And pay attention so that you never need Greg's yes. services. <laughs> Greg's services, Greg's information will be in all the descriptions below. And um, I'm going to try to throw it on the video as well, too. So we'll have that in there. But we'll, uh, we're going to throw this over to Greg first. I think we're starting off with safe storage laws in uh, 2023, 2024 here. Today, I'd like to talk about some of the things that we're seeing day in and day out, which are getting people arrested. Um, the, the first of those that we really need to talk about is gang violence. Uh, the gangs of today are not the gangs of yesterday. They are better organized. They are better funded. They are more heavily armed. They are more ruthless. And they are now every place. This used to be a problem that we thought of within a couple of the inner cities. It's not anymore. It is in every town in Connecticut they can now show up. The most common one that we're seeing at the moment is people, they leave something in their car. They lock it. Many cases, the key fob systems will automatically lock as they step away from their new cars. Yeah. And then they look on their ring camera, and lo and behold, there's somebody in their driveway inside their car. And they go on out, and how did they get in the car? It's not broken into. The answer is that they now have the technology that if your key fob is within a couple of hundred feet of that car, they can send a signal out to your key fob. Or when you use your key fob, when you come in, they can record those codes. And then transmit I, them. Absolutely. Wow. You yeah. walk away, you think your car is locked, and it is not. Now, there's, yeah, go can, ahead, Josh. Can we, so I, I've heard this before. Um, a way of preventing that, can you just manually hit the little button inside your door before you close it? I don't believe so. Okay. Um, maybe with some cars that will work. Um, however, um, many of the cars will simply not allow you to do that. You can only arm the alarm system by setting it from the key yeah. fob. Yep. Yeah. Uh, what I'm being told by law enforcement is get yourself either some tin foil and wrap it tightly around your keys when you get out of your car. Or I use a, uh, a little bag made by a third-party company called Mission Darkness. I don't get any revenue. I'm not promoting them. I just, that happens to be the one. There are others on the market. Some of them will block telephone signals. Some will not. 
Um, so you want to make sure that it's one of the mil spec ones that blocks all across the spectrum there. Um, it's a little bit of a pain in the neck to have to put your, your key fob into a little bag all the time. It's necessary. Uh, otherwise, anything that's within your car, obviously they can still break the windows, but it's more difficult. It attracts more attention. If they can simply open your locks, go in very quietly without setting off your alarm because they used your own codes, turn the alarm off, they're getting in. Wow. Number two, in Connecticut, if you leave a firearm in a car and it is not in a locking container, you're looking at a year in jail. I am seeing probably two to three of these cases every month. The prosecutors are relatively hard on it because they're tired of guns getting stolen and then being used by criminals on the street. So expect no mercy. You know, I, I, I just ran inside for 10 minutes. They don't care. So what is the, the answer to that one? And one of the things that I teach in the classes that I do is get some kind of a locking container to secure your gun inside the car. Personally, I like console vaults. These, if you have a uh, SUV, a truck, something of that sort, certain other vehicles, uh, they bolt right into your center console. They are relatively heavy duty. And when they come to break in and they open your console and they see the vault, they're just going to move on. It's not worth their time to try and open it. Now, many of my clients go out and they buy these small metal boxes that go under the seat. Uh, those are fine. They're perfectly legal. The only problem with it is you're sitting there in your seat. Now, how do you get under your seat to get the little box out? It's very hard to reach. So people get out of the car. They open the door. They bend over. They take the little box out. Sitting there holding up the little box. Then they take their gun with everybody watching it there. Try to put in the little box and put it under their seat. Legal? Yes. Smart? No. And this is the problem. Now, the statute says that you can put the gun in a locking glove box. And I repeat, locking. Is it a good idea? Not really. It's really easy to open a glove box in about 30 seconds. But the bigger problem that I see as an attorney, people sit there, they put their Glock into the center, into the glove box there. They get pulled over by the police for something. Mm -hmm. Officer says license and registration. And they reach in, open the glove box with the Glock sitting right there and reach for their gun. This may not end well. I've wholeheartedly told people, put your insurance and registration in your armrest. And that if your glove box is lockable, or that visor. way, or visor, yeah, <clears throat> that right. way you never, it, like I've always had it in my armrest. I've never put it in my glove box. So my brain's not going to be like, go there for it. But my, speaking of, you know, people breaking in and all that, yeah. and that can happen during the day and I get that. But I think at the, a bigger common problem we have is people think they they need a car gun and they leave it there 24 seven. Yeah. And I think that's part of the problem with this is that if they took their guns out, at least you'd be able to save yourself from having a gun stolen. You know, the, the problem is this, uh, you're driving around all of a sudden, you know, you get a call from your spouse. Um, I left the envelope in your car. You need to go over to the post office and mail it. Yeah. You have no stamps. You need to go inside the post office. As of the moment, at least in Connecticut, it appears that you cannot go into federal buildings. That's been the law for decades. That may change under the Bruin decision if there's a determination that it is not a sensitive place. Mm -hmm. But for the moment, until all of this clarifies, um, post offices are typically off bounds. Schools, typically the biggest of them. Um, Even the parking lots and people don't realize yeah. that. Yes. So at a minimum, if you have no choice, if the gun is unloaded, it's locked in a center console, it stays there. The chance that anybody would ever know 
you'd have a problem. You've got your Fourth Amendment protections against search and seizure there. When all of a sudden you need to be someplace, and I'm not suggesting you go to schools, but if it happens, as an attorney, am I going to be in a better position if it's loaded in your holster or unloaded and locked in a safe? Obviously the latter. Now, another thing that we've got here uh, that you should be aware of, when we look at the, the regulation on the car, it does not necessarily have to be you who is in the car. If any person who is over 21 years of age who may lawfully possess a firearm is in the car, that is sufficient. It does not have to be in the locking box. Mm-hmm. Many cops don't know this. You know, they're well-meaning. They know DUI really well, but these laws they don't know as well. Uh, Trunks work. If you have a work truck and you have one of those big, you know, diamond plate work boxes in the back of your truck with big locks on it, that's a relatively good place. They're relatively secure, and they're specifically provided for by statute. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the cases that we're handling this week An individual had a heavy-duty locking container, which utilized a heavy padlock. The firearms, the pistols, were in the back of his vehicle. Um, It has dark-tinted windows, not that it would be easy to see. The car was inside his garage. He gets a call from his neighbor. Um, Garage is open. Your doors are open. He -hmm. goes rushing down there and... um, Somebody had a little gadget, was able to get in. Oh, with the garage door opener, probably. And they got in. They were able to take his firearms. He immediately reported it to the police department. He came over, and they said, was the container, was the gun case locked to the vehicle? Did it have a chain to the vehicle? He said, no, just a padlock on it. They promptly charged him with seven counts. One for each gun in there. We are in court. Uh, State's attorney is not being very cooperative. Does it say in the law it has to be attached to the vehicle? Because I don't think so. The law says, refers to a safe. But what is a safe? So to answer that, we had to go back. The law is originally from 2019. So we had to go back to the legislative process. All of there, where the all of the legislators had discussed what this law means, and this issue was discussed, and it's very, very clear in the discussions in the Judiciary Committee, where it's asked, does the container have to be locked to the car, or does the container itself merely have to be locked? And it's clearly stated in there, no, it's merely that the container has to be locked. It does not have to be locked to the car. So we're going to win this one. It just amazes me that that person is the victim of a crime, right? Their property was stolen, and they're being treated like the criminal. And they got to pay money. they got to take time off of work to do all this when they didn't do anything wrong according to what the law states. Dates. And yes. I'm sure were there was their permit pulled. I don't know if you can say this, but was their permit pulled and like their other guns taken? Not so far. Okay. So I, I'm hopeful we will win it before that happens. Uh, we are headed in front of a judge. Um, I currently have a letter written from a member of the Judiciary Committee, State of Connecticut, hmm. uh, stating and providing specifically in there the transcripts from the law. That'll be provided to the judge. It's already been provided to the state's attorney. I expect we're going to win this one. However, this is indicative of even when the state's attorney has the letter, they still don't want to back down. Some of the state's attorneys are very, very aggressive. Uh, I'll give you another example right here. Um, My client went down to the gym. His firearm was in his center console. Um... He's working out. He comes back to his gym locker. The locker is open. His gym bag is open. And they have stolen his car keys. <gasps> he goes out into the parking lot. They've also stolen his car. Jeez. 
He calls the police. When the police get there, he says, by the way, uh, I have a pistol permit. I lawfully purchased a 9 millimeter something. It was in the center console of the firearm. He was promptly arrested. Was it locked in the center console? No. Oh. Bail was $25,000. Oh, my God. And as bad as that sounds, we've just had another one uh, down in Monroe. A contractor pulls into his million-dollar home. He's got his pistol in the center console. He is right in front of his workshop. He runs inside to get a saw, comes back out with the saw, and when he gets out there, his pistol is gone. $75,000 bail. So is there a sliding scale on this? Like, how are they coming up with those numbers? We don't know. I, I think what happens is that they, um, they have this little ball and they shake it. <laughs> okay. The magic eight ball. Yeah. Uh, there seems to be no rhyme or reason to it. No, because, like, and shouldn't there be, though? Like, of course. Bail's required to be reasonable by the Constitution. However, that's not what we're seeing. So we're seeing some very large bails. <laughs> Don't worry about it. You're good. He's a very busy man. Yeah. Hold on. I like the different ringtones, to be honest. I think it's the third different one. <laughs> no, it's not. It's the United States Coast Guard. Oh. Uh, oh, that's completely different. Then. That's why, yes. That is not my phone. That is. <laughs> Are they calling you in? No. Okay. <laughs> They're just talking among themselves, but it, <laughs> it's on a priority punch. All right. We'll pick it back up from there. You're okay. good. Keep You're going. Good. Keep it going. You're good. All right. So, you know, we, we've had the case recently with the stolen car. We've had the contractor. Um, we've had other individuals who just, you know, they we just had another one. He pulled his brand new Mercedes into a very expensive restaurant. He's got the gun. He parked it himself. He didn't use the valet parking. Okay. He parks it in there in the expensive restaurant parking lot. He comes on out, and his rear windows are smashed. They got his pistol. If your pistol is stolen out of your car, it is a near certainty that you are going to be arrested. Even if it's locked? Well, I guess you have to prove it's locked, well, don't you? If the gun is in a locking container, most departments will not arrest. I have one department here who clearly will until we can get a decision on this. The reality here... Something like 50 cars a day are being broken into in Hartford. All over the state, the break-ins are rampant. Mm. If you are going to leave a firearm in a car, assume it may be broken into, and you need to find some way to secure. If they're long guns, you really want them in the trunk. Um, preferably in a locking case in the trunk, Long guns in a car must be unloaded. You can carry a loaded pistol on your person in the car. Long guns cannot. Unless you are a police officer, long guns have to be unloaded. Mm -hmm. So guns are expensive. Number one, don't lose your expensive guns. Number two, don't get arrested under 2938 GA1 for improper storage of a firearm in a motor vehicle. So there's so many of these happening. That is the most likely way that a lawful gun owner will get arrested in the state of Connecticut. That's number one. Let, let's talk about another one right now because the law has changed tremendously. Um, currently, um, all firearms in your home must be secured when they are not on your person or within ready, ready use for self-defense. We don't know what that means. However, it comes out of the Heller decision where the, the court said that you couldn't require someone to keep all their guns locked in a safe because then they wouldn't have anything for self-defense. So these little pieces make it into the law, and unless you know all the case law, it makes no sense. It's subjective. Of, 
It is subjective. Of course, if you um, do know all of the cases um, in Connecticut, they still make no sense. Mm -hmm. So we're, people ask me all the time, can I use a locking closet to secure a gun or must it be a safe? A locking closet generally is fine as long as it's reasonable that an unauthorized person would not be able to get in. So if you've got a little hollow door and you've got a little bathroom lock with a little hole in it, and you know, and you can stick a little toothpick in there and open it, that's probably not going to do it. Mm-hmm. However, if you've got a secure lock on a secure door, for many of us, it's just not possible to have enough safes in order to secure all of our guns inside of safes. Um, I had one person, uh, you know, <laughs> advise me of the fact that the number of safes he needed would collapse the floors in his house. Yep. At least he did the research beforehand. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the person downstairs would have been very unhappy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. So the, it's kind of a common sense approach. Now, if someone comes into your house and your guns are not secured, you're going to get arrested. If someone uses that gun, you are strictly liable for any harm they do. Now, there is a provision in there where if they break and entering, you're not strictly liable, but you still get arrested for improper storage. So no matter how you cut it, in this day and age, now are there exceptions? One exception is antiques, guns built before 1896. So if you've got, you know, grandfather's flintlock over the mantle, you know, built in 1824, it's fine. But modern firearms need to be secured in this day and age. So that's that's the safe storage portion of it. That's not all of it, but key points that are getting people arrested on it. Another thing that is creating a lot of trouble right now is we're getting just daily calls from people who have no idea what needs to be done under the new assault weapon registration law here in Connecticut, what they're calling the 2023 assault weapons. Okay, so what what is this? Uh, when we look back at the history of the assault weapon legislation, the first of these acts come about in 1993, became effective in 1994. Um, the act was challenged in Benjamin versus Bailey, um, Wes Horton and myself took that to trial and then up to the Supreme Court. And it was just too early. Uh, We didn't have the Heller case yet. We didn't have McDonald. We didn't have Bruin. We didn't have the case law we needed to establish the standards. And the court in just one of the most remarkable pieces of legal decision-making there ruled, well... The law is void for vagueness and unconstitutional if a person of common intelligence doesn't know what's prohibited. But since people could just go get a catalog from the manufacturer and look it up, what's so confusing? What's so confusing is you have no idea what you're talking about. We discussed this in our briefs, and it is utterly and completely ridiculous. When Colt says, and people refer to something as a Colt AR-15, because the original act says AR-15 or Sporter. At the time, there were 160 different models. And we brought this up to Judge Drang Guinness at trial. And we said, Your Honor, there's all different kinds of models. They all kind of look the same, but they're all different models. Which one is the one that's in the act? And what Judge Drang Guinness said, and this is true to today, is you look at the side of the receiver and you see what it says on the gun. And if it does not say precisely what it says in the act, then it is not one of these original 56 specified guns. Well, if it was made prior to that act, September 13, 1994, and it's not exactly as on the gun, what we call specified guns, then we call it a pre-ban well, that was 30 years ago. Back when I did that, I had a hair. And um, most people don't remember that. And some days I have trouble remembering it as well. But 
be it as it may, this is still how we determine whether or not a firearm is a pre-ban. The new act, the 2023 assault weapons law that's come in. Remember, we were talking about the 2023. It's only been about two minutes here. The So there, if it's one of those guns, what we refer to as a pre-ban, it is needing, it will have to be registered by the end of April 2024. Date's coming up on us very quick. We'll see how this gets posted up there. Mm-hmm. And with a little bit of luck, we'll get it out there so people will know. Um, the second group of guns, which are re- going to be required to be registered, are so-called CT Others. These are firearms that typically have a wrist brace on them. They typically have a short barrel, although they don't have to. And they have a detachable magazine. And a forward grip. Yep. The forward grip, interestingly, uh, was something the industry came up with. And it's not actually part of the law. The, thing, the way that this came about is that many of the original guns, which were the first of the others, were classified as pistols, mm-hmm. AR-15 pistols. They were putting braces on them so pis- people coming back from Iraq who were disabled could still shoot. Mm-hmm. And ATF said that's fine. However, um, as they began to develop this concept of others, they moved away from the concept of pistols. And as they did that, the federal definition of a pistol is that it is intended to be fired one-handed. Anybody ever seen anybody fire one-handed anymore? (laughs) I mean, you know, that's like Hawaii Five-0 movies, right? (laughs) You know, we don't do that anymore. But the, the federal law takes a little while to... In 1968, this is, this is how they defined a pistol federally. And on a pistol, you cannot have a forward grip. Correct. But when they came in on the original definition of these so-called others, the ATF said, well, it's not a rifle. It's not intended to be fired from the shoulder. It's not a shotgun... It's not a long gun intended to be fired from the shoulder with a smooth bore. It's not a pistol. It's not intended to be fired one-handed. And that's where we got the forward grip. Because it wasn't an SBR either. Right. Right. It was in order for them to establish that the gun is not intended to be fired one-handed, they put a forward grip on it. Now, what about if it had a forward strap rather than a forward grip? And I've had people all over the industry, no, no, you can't do that. It it has to be a forward grip. It has to be vertical. It has to be at least five inches. No, it doesn't. However, typically they did. It's perfectly acceptable on an other. You still cannot put a forward grip on a pistol. Correct. Take a look and see what you have. Uh, Once you put it onto a pistol, it comes under the National Firearms Act. Now, just to make this a little more complicated... Under Connecticut law, any firearm under 12-inch barrel is a pistol. Correct. So the federal law and the state law are different. And people ask me, why do others have a 12-and-a-half-inch barrel? Why? Because if it was shorter, it would be a pistol. Once it was a pistol... Rifle, pistol, shotgun with a detachable magazine became a banned assault weapon under the prior law, under the 94, going forward to 2013, all of the characteristic tests, and up until the new law. So as a result of that, the barrels had to be at least 12 and a half inches. Now, just to make it a little more complicated... Our friends over at the senior level of the ATF looked at it and said, we really don't like these um, CT others and the others as they exist in the other states. They look too much like short barrel rifles. People could take that wrist brace, put it up against their shoulder, and it looks like a SBR, short barrel rifle. We don't like that. We don't like that at all. So the people in Washington went back to the drawing boards, and they came up with a new ATF regulation. And they came up with this characteristics test, what they called a factoring test. 
and you went through this whole spreadsheet to see whether or not on the factoring test, whether or not your other was now a NFA, National Firearms Act, short barrel rifle. And coincidentally, essentially all of them were. Mm -hmm. What a surprise. (laughs) But then they came in and they said, listen, we're really very nice people. And we know if we just outlaw them without asking Congress, we probably wouldn't get away with it. So what we're going to do here is we're going to tell you have to register it, but you won't have to pay the $200 tax. We're going to create something called an ATF Form 1E. The normal form would be a Form 1, which requires a $200 tax. The E was going to be exempt from payment of the tax. Well, where does the power to tax come from? It comes from Article 1 of the U.S. Constitution, which exclusively reserves the right to raise taxes to the Congress. And the $200 tax was by statute created in 1934 in the National Firearms Act. So if only Congress can raise taxes, can the ATF waive a tax required by the Congress? No, they cannot. Now, when it all got to court several months ago, um, didn't even get to the issue of whether or not it was illegally waived tax. It didn't pass the first hurdle of whether they'd even complied with the Federal Administrative Procedures Act. And the courts came back and said, it is clear that the ATF failed to comply with federal law in the adoption of it and issued a stay, which is nationwide. So what we had was people who may have heard my CCDL talk or something of that sort six months ago where I was coming in and saying, unfortunately, under the new law, you're either going to have to change out your barrel to 16 inches so you don't have a short barrel, or you have to remove your wrist brace. Well, the federal law is now gone. So if you put a 16-inch barrel on your gun and your neighbor still has your 12-inch, you would not have a combination of parts, you can go back next door and put your 12-and-a-half-inch barrel back on. Same thing for your wrist brace. Under Connecticut law and federal law, they're just fine. But I have a question. So a stay doesn't really mean it's gone. It just means it's now in limbo until they decide to raise it again. Uh, it is stayed until the court has the abil- has a chance to hear the entire case on the merits, given the fact that it's a question of law, and it's already been very carefully briefed before a number of courts, it is very unlikely to be un- overturned. Okay. It would appear that 2021 is dead. Okay. What we often call R8. Okay. 2021F-08R. Good. So it appears that that's a dead statute. For the moment, it appears we can pretty much ignore it. And from a legal standpoint, let me add another question because there's going to be a lot of people out there that did their Form 1E. Yes. And that gave them a free tax stamp. However, at the back of that Form E, it said, pursuant to the brace rule, ATF brace rule 2023. So if that's a stay, you technically, do we have a free tax stamp or do we no longer, is it null and void at this point? We haven't a bloody clue. (laughs) So somebody that I was talking to today says, um, well, it hasn't been revoked because there's a process Mm -hmm. to revoke your tax stamp. Well, my guess is they're going to have to do something like that officially. But, But you have no tax stamp. When you look at those 1E forms, they send you back the Form 1. There's no tax stamp attached. They're right. And we just don't know. Um, And I, shortly after all of this happened, before the district court had ruled, I met with a very high-ranking member of the legal team over at ATF. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how did you guys do this. I mean, it seems apparent that this is fraught with troubles. And the answer that I got, nobody asked our opinion here in legal as to whether or not this was valid. Oh my God. So you have a legal department that you didn't consult. It happens. That's tax dollars for you, right? It, it also happens a lot in, in different entities. They just, 
they, it's a great idea. We're going to push it through. It, the federal government. I, I'm you sure there's better. lawyers up there someplace who must signed off on this, but the the people were at the relatively high region level. Oh. Apparently, we're clueless. So here we are. The federal law is gone. Everybody's like, hallelujah. You know, we're, we're all free and safe now. <laughs> and on comes our good friend, uh, Ned Lamont. Good old King Ned. <laughs> and uh, who exactly. comes through exactly. with the, the assault weapons law, which basically says, well, we're going to make you register all of these firearms and get an assault weapon certificate like we did back in 2013. We're going to stop the sales and we're going to force all of you to get a, this assault weapon certificate. Well, let's think about this for the moment. Um, the assault weapon certificate registration form is called a 414C form. And we're going to talk more about that this evening. However, what information is on the 414C form that they don't already have if you have a pistol permit? This, zero, zero. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> and people are like, what do they need this for? Right. They already have it. It's on the Social DPS. Social security re- number, maybe. You know, I... When I talked to SLFU, I asked yeah. that exact question. I said, you already have all of these records. And they said, no, we need it on another registration. I can see that. I can't see any reason for it, but <laughs> let, let, let's think about this, though. As, as to the issue of the Social Security number, we don't know the answer to it. Um, a Social Security number is a federal number, mm-hmm. and Congress specifically provided that it shall not be used for any purpose other than Social Security, i.e. you shall not use it to register guns. That's why it's optional on everything else, but this is well, not. not that form. And the we 2013 form, it was mm-hmm. optional. Yeah. We don't know the answer to it. The question is, my guess is that many, many people are not going to fill it in. And I doubt they would want to go to court to challenge this. So I don't know the answer, but I will tell you that if I was their counsel and somebody asked, do you think we should litigate this? Um, I would probably leave it alone. So that we'll leave that one as an open question there for people to decide. Um, what do I think is really going on here? We believe that there's probably about 200,000 guns, which technically would need to be registered. Maybe that number's 150,000. The state tells us just in others, as of a couple of years before the act, it was 94,000, not including the pre-bans. Not including the vast amount of stripped lowers that were sold prior to June 6th. Correct. Yes. That was a last minute, yeah. Yeah, that was a last minute barrage of utter hell. And we'll we'll come back to that. Oh, yeah. And we'll, we'll come back. We'll, we'll discuss the lower issue specifically. But the key is this. Um, I was at SLFU last week, and I asked them, as of last week, so today, uh, you know, it must have been around, right around the beginning of April. So I met with the head of SLFU, and I said, how many have been filed? At that time, approximately 9,000 guns had been registered. Now, by the time we get to the end of April, maybe that number is going to be 20,000. Maybe it's going to be 30,000. But if there's 150,000 that need to be registered, that means 120,000 people have done something else. Now, some of those guns have gone out of state. And if they leave the state, they're fine. Um, I recently was in New Hampshire, and there were all of these self-storage places right on the border. And I noticed that the owners of all the self-storage places have got like $100,000 pickup trucks and new Mercedes. All of those were paid with the money that they have made storing Connecticut assault weapons. Well, and the other thing is, too, look at what happened in 2013 with that registration. We had what? tops 15,000 compliance a 15% compliance rate so how they expect to have a bigger compliance rate is beyond me like I've said all along the only reason people they, would is they've made it a little nicer because you can make a true rifle once it's 
I, the salty. I don't believe they want people to register. Really? And here's why. Let's assume you bought it from a dealer. Mm-hmm. You bought it, you know, lock and load. You came on here, you bought it legally. Mm-hmm. When you did, you filed out a DPS3 form you filed. Mm-hmm. They know you've got it. And since they know you've got it, and there's no information on the registration, on the new certificate that they don't already have, there's no downside to filing. But if you do not file, now they come back and they go through the records, and presumably what's going to happen is the decision will probably be made by William Tong's office, the Connecticut Attorney General. So if the Attorney General looks at it and says, we have 100,000 people who did not comply with the law, the guns are essentially contraband, at least from his perspective, under the Second Amendment and under the Article I, Section 15 of the Connecticut Constitution, I would say that is fundamentally wrong. These guns are protected. But until the Supreme Court gets there for us, there's going to be a window here. And are they going to go door to door to 100,000 homes with six officers? <laughs> and if they want to do it, over the next thousand years, they could achieve this. They don't have the manpower to go door to door, but well, and even if they did go door to door and confiscate, you've also got to charge people. So, what are the consequences going to be, and how are they going to be able to actually follow through on all that? Failure to file under the assault weapons law is it? Good? But they don't have a place to put anybody in jail. I mean, those kinds of numbers, we don't have the place just to put them. And are they just going to file? Chart like fines? I mean, my belief is that what's likely to happen here, and I'm guessing, but you know, based on everything I know, and this is my 39th year of working in firearms compliance, I have been through many farmer laws. My belief is they're going to send out a letter saying, either provide us with proof that the gun was removed from the state, it has been destroyed, sold to a dealer. Or surrender it. Now, if you do not do that, are they going to come to your door? Probably not. Are they going to renew your pistol permit? Are they going to renew your driver's license? Um, Unfortunately, um, William Tong appears to clearly believe that Connecticut would be better off without firearms, or at least without most of them. Except the ones that protect him. Or his personal. (laughs) Isn't that a surprise? Listen, I don't want to put words in the mouth of the Attorney General. The Attorney General will tell us what his position is on behalf of the state of Connecticut. Um, However, my concern is, based on what we know right now, there is a significant risk that if you do not file that this may have serious repercussions sometime down the road. I don't think they'll go door to door, but I think they may try to take administrative actions. Uh, Anybody who doesn't think they can do that, uh, try to be a little late on your property taxes and see whether or not you can register your car. So I I am very, very concerned about this. Especially like the assault weapon registration the online system is directly connected with your pistol permit. The re- the renewal is the same yeah. login, and so is the change of address. It's all the same system. Now, now here's the next one. I mean, one of the questions we're getting is, if you just plain go over to the state police, you go right over to their firearms page, their basic page, and you click on the link for firearms and look for the link here, over four assault weapons, you don't find it. It's there, but it's they it's managed to hide it. Mm-hmm. Um, another, I'm going to mention another organization here I have no relationship to, uh, is AR15.com. If you Google in AR15.com and include with that Connecticut Assault Weapons Registration or online portal, it pops right up. It's really well done. Now, if AR15 can do this really, really well, why couldn't the state put the link up there really, really well? 
But all I can tell you is it just, you click right there. It's got frequently asked questions. It has all the instructions. Now, these instructions come from the state police. The only thing the state police doesn't give us is an easy way to find them. <laughs> so go on over to AR15.com, look through Portal. It'll go right in. The links will come up. Now, once it comes up, the procedure is not terrible. Uh, basically, the first thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to create an online account with them. And it's pretty basic. You know, what is your name? Where do you live? What is your driver's license? What is your pistol permit? And if you don't have a pistol permit, there is a way to do it without a pistol permit. But you go through, then they've got two-factor authentication. So they've got to send a code back to your phone. So they're going to text that back to you. You then load that code in like most modern software. At that point, you've got a password there, and you're able to log into the system. Once you log in, you're able to look at an online portal which will tell you which guns the state police think you have. Mm -hmm. Thanks is a key word. Have you tried this, Michelle? Yeah. The um, answer I got is because there's stuff on there that I sold, and I was like, wait a minute, I sold that. There's stuff on there that... They said, well, they said it will always stay there because they use stuff it for missing. Trace. I'm okay with missing. It's Both. when they have... When they have Both. stuff that you don't, that you never owned, that's a now, problem. Oh. I, I understand they're a little backed up. <laughs> you know, I don't know, like 100,000 DPS3s or something. Back to 2020. Right. We, oh we have to God. file them by the end of the close of business, <laughs> but, uh, but they're four years behind. Okay. Yeah. Uh, be it as it may. Um, <laughs> it may be there. It may not be. I can't find any rhyme to reason why some are there and some are not. However, your guns may not be on the list there. There may also be guns. If you had a gun and you sold it any time, I don't know, after Christopher Columbus got here, um, as I say, they're a little backed up. Um, I can tell you that there are guns on my list, which I sold to a dealer in 1983. Anybody watching this who was alive in 1983? I was. All right. You but it, a large customer base, yeah. So, I, as I say, I had hair back then. A lot of it, but there, I, I knew this day was coming. There, uh, so when I look at it, the list is horrible. Mm -hmm. There are guns on my list I have never owned. There That's are, a problem. There are guns I sold decades ago to dealers. Now, fortunately, my paperwork is good. I have all the documents. So if they ever came to my house and said, have you got a bill of sale for this gun you sold in 1983 to Jade Gun Store? Rest in, pe rest in peace, Joe Zubak. He just passed. Good man. Um, however, um, bought him from Joe, what, 30-something years ago, 40 years ago. Sold them to a dealer 40 years ago. They're still on my list. So the list is a mess. Now, one of the things that they tell you is that if you need to register a firearm under this new act, it's a CT other or a pre-ban, mm -hmm. and it's not on your list, what you do is you just print the form out, and under manufacturer, you put unknown. In, no, on the on the portal now. There's yep. actually a place where a you button. can there, you can add a yep. gun. You can be on yes, database. But it says in the frequently asked questions that if it's not in their database under manufacturer listed as unknown. Oh yes, when you drop the drop down, yes, it makes Sorry. no sense. And the easy ones are in, not on the drop down. Right. It's really weird, but like weird ones are there. So meanwhile, if you have the DPS three from when you bought it. You're going to fill out this 414 form, and there's a top and a bottom to it. And you need to put a right thumbprint on it. For those who are dyslexic, you know, ask somebody to help. Okay. I, didn't, I don't understand the thumbprint either. Why? Right. Um, especially if you have a pistol permit. Yeah. Well, all, my, all my fingers have been fi printed then. Several times. All yeah. 12 of them. <laughs> all 12, yeah. Right. <laughs> Happens. There, um, but be it as it may, you, you can't ask why with this law. Uh, they simply do. Remember, the people who are making these laws, many of them have never actually seen a gun. Even those that do have seen guns, even those that own guns, they don't care. You shouldn't have them. A Connecticut state judge said to me a few weeks ago, 
counselor. Normal people don't carry concealed guns in public. And all I can do is bite my lip because that's what we're dealing with here. They have no idea that we carry guns because they don't see them. Are we only supposed to carry concealed guns in private? Like, because that's kind of defeating. It's the for purpose. Decepticons. <laughs> when that toaster I, fights back, I, I think this is this is probably the answer. Like, but well, they don't know. Um, th- there was a movie out there called Men in Black. Yeah. And there's a scene in there where they say they don't want to know we exist. Mm-hmm. Antis feel exactly that way about us. They don't want to know that we carry guns. They want to live in their little dream that we don't exist. Mm-hmm. And largely, they have no clue. You know, it's, it's like in Men in Black. You know, all of a sudden, you know, he puts on the, the glasses and he looks around and here's all of these aliens walking around glowing with little lights and stuff. Mm-hmm. Where are the aliens? Uh, to them, at least. So, it's, um, but they're... As we look at this, this is how we got to where we are today. They don't want to know, and largely they understand, at least at the higher levels. When you look at up within law enforcement, if you ask them, how many crimes do pistol permit holders commit? And statistically, the answer is zero. The crazy people do crazy things. And crazy people are, by and large, not allowed to have guns. But when the 2013 Act was approved, the SAFE Act in there, it provided that when doctors had a patient who was dangerous, they were supposed to report if these people have been committed over to the state police. But then they added at the last moment a little provision, unless the doctor believes that it's not in the medical best interest of their patient. And under that little exception, as far as I can tell, essentially no doctors report that their patients are dangerous. Now, if they're committed by a probate court, that'll get reported. Um, If it goes through the criminal court, it'll get reported. But large numbers of people slip through the cracks because the doctors do not want to report that they know these people are dangerous. You know, if he just was running around town, you know, trying to slash people with a machete, we probably, he's probably not a real good candidate here. And this is what makes this so hard. When we look at 99% of the people out here, you get properly trained so you don't have you know, accidents of just, you know, lack of understanding. And they will safely own firearms for their entire life. Nobody will ever know. Um, It's perfectly fine. Also required by Article 1, Section 15 of the Connecticut Constitution, one of the strongest provisions for self-defense in the country. But um, Democrats do not want to deal with mental health in part because it's very expensive and they don't have the money to do it. It's strangely, a lot of the support for mental health in Connecticut comes from the Republicans. Here we are, but the Republicans understand that these people need medical treatment. They need to take their meds. They need visiting nurses. All of these things that we cut out budgets for got us to where we are today. And because they don't want to fix the problem of mental health or the other big one, legalization of drugs, you know, no matter what you think about, you know, individual liberties of adults in their own home. I am, I'm a constitutional lawyer. I believe in civil liberties. I believe what adults want to do in their own home is largely up to them. Should not be a state decision. However, It's not how it's working out. The drugs are pouring across the southern border. There's nothing in there that ever intended that fentanyl would be readily available in the high schools. Where's the fentanyl come from? 
It appears that it comes out of a lab in Wuhan, China. What a surprise. It is shipped into Mexico, supposedly to be used in pharmaceuticals. And a hundred and I believe 20,000 people died in America last year from fentanyl overdose. We hear it over and over again. 50,000 people died from guns last year. Yes, 39,000 of them were drug dealers and a whole bunch more of them were doing other bad things. But when we look at fentanyl, this is something that could be stopped in a day. If we would get tough about the fentanyl going from China into Mexico, they say they've done something about it, but volunteer firefighter, I got to tell you, I'm still seeing an awful lot of fentanyl out there. I just want to throw in here, Wuhan's yeah. been very busy. You know, <laughs> they, they have, and, you know, I'm, I, just, I, I actually kind of wondered whether or not, you know, during the height of COVID, whether or not they shut down the fentanyl lab over there. <laughs> But if, if so, there still seems to have been enough in the supply chain. But to, to bring this I around. I was thinking it. Back, I just wasn't going to say it. <laughs> Leave it to me. Right. I got it. <laughs> yep. To, but, you know, to bring this around here, we are blamed for problems that have nothing to do with us, the law-abiding gun owners. We're just a scapegoat. We're easy. It, it's cheap to make laws against us. It's expensive to make laws for, to deal with mental health. And I'm not sure what it is they want to do about drugs. They seem to think there's something very, very noble about letting people do whatever they want with poisons. Well, and, and law-abiding citizens, which is the target, Yeah, we're law-abiding citizens essentially because yeah. we want to follow the law. The other ones that they want, you know, the criminal aspect and that kind of stuff, yeah. they aren't ever going to follow any of these laws. Yeah. So it's easier to to tap us down because the general public wants to follow the law. If you could get the drugs, the hard drugs off the street, the number of shootings in Connecticut would go down to almost zero. Mm -hmm. The drug trade drives the drug war, which drives these drive-by shootings and the tragedy which is occurring within our cities every day day and it is a tragedy these people are dying because of a misguided policy which has made it far too easy for these drugs to be distributed across our state but we're it so just understand when you ask me why are these laws passed these foolish laws understand it's got very little to do with gun control it has a lot to do with scapegoating us for a problem which has nothing to do with us. Now, when we take a look, we've talked a little bit about the assault weapons law here. We've talked a little bit here about the safe storage law here. Other things that are creating problems out there that are getting people into trouble. The next big one is red flag, the risk protection order. The theory behind this is that this was going to deal with these mental health problems. The concept was right, but we opposed it among many of the Republican legislators under a belief that it would be abused. And that's where we are today. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you a couple of examples, and I, I will not name any names. I don't think my clients will object to this because only they will know. <laughs> kind of like their hairdresser. <laughs> I don't have a hairdresser. <laughs> so the when we look at this, my my client comes home and her cat has died. She's understandably, you know, very upset. And what does she do? She goes to her Facebook page. I'm very sad my cat died today. And one of her best friends forever, who's never met her, sees her post and says, oh, no, I better call the police and have them go check up on her to make sure she's okay. So the police show up at her house, and she's sitting there. Her cat has just died, so she decided she would have a few too many drinks, which is very unusual for her. And um, 
cops knock on the door. She comes to the door. She's quite drunk. And um, I say, are you doing okay? And she's like, no, I'm not okay. My cat died. So what do they do? They take her down to the psychiatric center. But that's a typical answer. They seize all of her guns with no warrant. Not supposed to do. And in the morning, the hospital releases her with a note. Why did you bring this woman here? There's nothing wrong with her. She was drunk and her cat died. She was sad. You've never heard this before? No. Well, I've heard I've heard Greg tell this before. No, that's awful. <laughs> it's ama- it, yeah, it, awful. It goes to court on the hearing. I'm not the attorney on this one. I picked it up later. I got her. They also revoked her pistol permit, which I got back for her. But when she goes to court, the judge sustained it. Judge found, I, I, I think, you know, you're, you're, being the fact that you were so upset, I, I think it would be better. Come back in six months. I, I'm going to let this order stand. What? That's where we are today. Case after case after case of things that are perfectly normal. We all have bad days that doesn't mean we're going to go shoot somebody shoot ourselves. all of her guns were locked in the safe at all times here's another one and my client's wife is in the hospital she's recovering nicely they tell him your wife can go home on saturday wonderful he's all excited He goes down to the hospital Saturday morning to pick up his wife. And they say, oh, didn't anybody tell you? She died. He's like, no, I'm picking her up today. No, uh, she died. We should have called you. He goes home. He sits down. He's obviously, you know, very distraught. He calls one of his neighbors. And he's just crying and crying and perfectly normal the neighbor says you know um he does own guns even though they're all locked in a safe the neighbor says you know maybe we should call the police just to be safe and the police department came down and they seized all of his guns and they took him down to a psychiatric center which once again said nothing wrong with this man on the fact that his wife has just died. You think he may be a little upset? So we were able to win that one. You know, fortunately, I was in there. Um, we were able to explain the entire situation. Common sense prevailed. Isn't there a way on situations like these? Mm-hmm. Okay, because this is just egregious, in my opinion. Isn't there a way that there can be a countersuit against the state, the state or something for the extra duress that they're putting these people through when they're going through a bad time? Yeah. And the problem is, and the judges have told me this, we don't want to be wrong. The judges say if we are uncertain, mm-hmm. if a person's going through a difficult time, we would rather take the safe approach and violate your fundamental constitutional rights, then take a chance that you might do something, and I might get blamed for it. Speaking of duress, I'm still in shock that his wife died. I can't believe it's, the hospital didn't call, but I, this just gets so yeah, bad. I mean, I, I, I understand that the judges are trying to do the right thing. And by and large, judges in Connecticut are a, a very fine group of people. Um, but... He Having has to said say that, that, Michelle, you all just saw Michelle's face. <laughs> he works with them every day. I am a commissioner of the Superior Court. See, okay, all okay, attorneys okay, are. Okay. No, but uh, honestly, you know, most judges are pretty good. I've Many judges are not that familiar with firearms. Um, I had a state's attorney the other day <laughs> tell me that they are very concerned about the case with my client. I said, "Why?" He said, according to his record, he owns seven guns. <laughs> what kind of a person would own seven guns? He needs and more. I was going to say a poor person. 
Like, Sorry, everyone. No, no offense there. Okay. A funny, a funny story. <laughs> funny true story. Enough years have gone by. So many, many years ago, uh, there's a very famous firearms trainer. His name's Masada Yub. Yep. Moss used to come up here to Kinetic. Superb trainer. Uh, excellent expert witness. And Moss comes up, and I walk over into his class to come see what he's doing down here. We had, he had been used to call my old firm, Benenson and Cates, fairly frequently. And I walk in, and Moss looks at me and goes, Miller, we need to do something about your concealment. I said, Moss, you, you can see my gun? He says, Miller, it's, I'll take a bet. It's a 1911. It sticks out like a sore thumb. And um, I had all my guns unloaded just because I had set Moss up for this. So I take the 1911 out. I lay it down on the table and then took off the other 10 guns I was wearing. And the last <laughs> one I took out was the Mac 10 <laughs> which I sold 30 years ago. It was semi-auto, and the state police say I still own it. <laughs> Thank you. I have the DPS-3. Okay. But, um, you know, as it may... Um, these issues are out there. One of the things that you need to be very, very aware of is that if you get sucked into this system, it gets really expensive fast. And it's not just the lawyer. Expert witnesses, private investigators are very pricey. I'm going to mention another case right now. Um, my client is a distinguished former member of the U.S. Armed Forces, highly decorated, very bright guy, uh, holds multiple engineering degrees, led a completely respectable life. Um, he gets a call one night from a young lady. She's going through a divorce. She's going through a tough time. She just she knew him from high school. They talked from time to time. She said, any chance you could come down and talk to me? And he's like, yeah, I guess so. I don't have much time. I'm leaving on a trip first thing in the morning to go down to the Caribbean. I don't have a lot of time, but yeah, I'll see you for a few minutes. We'll come by. It's St. Patrick's Day. And she wants to get some Irish egg roll to go from the local Irish bar. So they go on into the bar. They order the Irish egg roll. He's been to the bar many times, you know, never been a problem. And out of the blue, some woman he has never seen confronts him and says, you've been sleeping with my man's woman. Excuse me? Uh, I, I still don't know what that means. I need an algebraic equation for that one. It, it, it won't help. Open relationship. Um, the, it, she gets in his face. The next thing that he knows... I guess her man, I think that's who it was, hits my guy from behind. Oh. And he's six foot six. Mm. My guy turns around, takes a look at it, and the next thing he knows, five more of his buddies come pouring on him. Well, he's just trying to get out of the bar. He's just trying to get out of there. It is whatever has happened, it's not good. He just wants to leave. So he's trying to work his way to the door, and uh, as he's going out the door, someone grabs him from behind and manages to knock his unloaded pistol partway out of his holster. He's tr trying to secure it in the holster, and lo and behold, an off-duty officer comes over, grabs him, and grabs the gun. My guy doesn't know it's an off-duty officer. So there's a little bit of a tussle there. The guy identifies himself as an officer, takes the gun. My guy gets out the door. And the police are standing outside. Why? Because it's an Irish bar on St. Patrick's Day, and the cops were sitting in the parking lot. Okay. So he gets on out, and uh, the officer says, this man pointed a gun at somebody. My guy's like, no, I didn't. You grabbed my arm. Well, he got charged felony. It goes down. We've got all kinds of troubles. 18 months in court. Oof. Private investigators, hired expert witnesses, many, many appearances in court, and tens of thousands of dollars later, this case gets dismissed. My client is now suing the bar. 
And uh, we'll see where everything goes on it. However, for the average person, if all of a sudden you found yourself with tens of thousands of dollars worth of legal bills to try and get a dismissal or plead guilty, take some kind of a program in there and get out of there, unless you've got some kind of a vast wealth of your own or some kind of a program that's going to pay your fees, you're out of luck. And this is the problem. Most people cannot afford to pay what a criminal defense, especially a felony criminal defense, is going to cost. Through trial, you can easily be more than $100,000. So it's a very, very serious thing. Um, There's a number of programs that are out there that will help to cover these types of things. I won't go into what's good, what's bad. Um, So, but they're they're out there. You certainly want to have something. We'll bring up three, right? So you're the main attorney for U.S. Law Shield in the state of Connecticut. I am. Um, So U.S. Law Shield. There's USCCA, and then I think the third bigger one is probably like CCW Safe. Um, there's, yeah. I know there's like attorneys on retainer. There's some other ones out there too. Um, I always say to people, have something, right? Because um, they're all a little different. Yeah. You have car insurance. You have homeowners or renters insurance. If you got a boat, you got boat insurance. Um, you have life insurance. You have health insurance. Have gun insurance, self defense insurance. Because that amount of money um, that you have to pay out of pocket is ridiculous. And for, mm-hmm. you know, the, what's a U.S. law show? Is it 1295 a month? Yeah, I mean, you know, month? if you take all like the other programs and yeah. everything, yeah, I mean, maybe you get up to $20 a month. I mean, I mean the thing yeah. that, you know, I, I don't want to go into the details. I mean, one of the things I like, though, I don't know, but I can't speak to the other programs. One of the things that I like is that, Uh, If you have the program and you have a question, you can call me up and ask the question. So legal time is expensive. Uh, Most members, it appears, will use enough time in a year with general questions that they ask me. Is this gun legal? How do I handle this in a state? Basic kinds of questions of that sort generally is more legal time than what it costs them to have the policy. So basically, you're just paying for what you can use in legal time, and the insurance policy is essentially free. It's just basically a, a free perk that you get with it. So, you know, I like that. Uh, you know, in the, the organization that I'm with, I'm on monthly retainer. I get paid, you know, whether I'm doing things or not, and what I'm getting paid for is to answer questions for the members. That I like. You know, it allows me to keep people out of trouble. Uh, maybe the other programs have got things that are similar. I don't know. but it, And you answer a lot of questions. Uh, six today. So fairly only, common. Only six? Yeah, six today. I feel like that's low. Yeah, you know, and sometimes it's just, you know, yes or no. Other times it's a half hour on the phone. Half hour on the phone is essentially what you pay for a year of the membership in there. Right. So, you know, to my perspective, I mean, I... One of the things that I hate is having to defend innocent people. You know, it it may seem very noble out here, but to sit behind my desk and have to explain to people that money that they have spent years saving for their retirement is suddenly going to get burned up, defending them against a crime that they did not commit. So for me, it's great. People come on in, they call me up, and by the way, I've got a membership. It's like, great, now all I have to do is focus on defending you. I don't need to take your life savings. I don't need to worry about whether I'm going to have enough money from you in order to do a first-rate job. I have no cap. The rules that I have are simply win. Go on in. Do whatever you need. Hire the private investigators. Hire the expert witnesses. Um, If I don't have enough manpower for it, my backup is Christian Young over at Cohen and Wolf. Superb lawyer. Uh, If something needs to go to a heavy trial, you know, Christian's done many more than I have. I'm in gun court probably more than most, but if you're charged with murder, 
Christians, the guy who I would want, he's very good. So, you know, that's there. He's got 50 attorneys over there. And, you know, that's, that's a nice backup for me. I have other people around as well. And I've got the entire organization um, with 750,000 members out there, you know, and a number of attorneys across the state. If I've got a problem, I can call down to one of the other states, get one of the people down there and say, hey, you know, can you help out on a Zoom meeting here? we got to help to do prep on this, things of that sort. So whichever organization you get, there's a lot more to it than you might think. Let me talk about another area here, which is creating a lot of problems. And that's uh, school bullying. Um, We see more and more cases where nice kids are getting bullied by not nice kids. So you've got a child, maybe, you know, they're a little timid. You know, they're there. They just, they're always polite. And now we've got these, you know, children of, I don't know what, who go around, who think it's, you know, perfectly acceptable to just bully these, these kids. Before you know it, some kind of words are exchanged, and both of them are brought down to the principal's office. In this day and age, that's probably going to involve the school resource officer. School resource officer may well refer the case over to juvenile Justice over there, the criminal part for for juveniles. If you've got a child in high school and they're suddenly in the juvenile system, this is not helping their chances. Uh, Recent case, um, individual, top student, varsity athlete, goes out to the mall with a couple of his friends. They're just horsing around, just having fun. One of the girlfriends is there. She jumps into the middle of it. And they're just playing. They're all laughing and having a good time. But when she gets home, she's got a black and blue mark on her. Mommy asks, what happened to you? Well, so-and-so grabbed me and, you know, it just, they were playing a little rough. Mommy says, not with my daughter, and dials 911. I get the call from the organization that they have to be in the principal's office with the school resource officer at 8 a.m. the next day morning. Well, get on up. I get on out there. I introduce myself. I'm able to talk with the officer. I spent 12 years in the security industry on the board of directors of a large national entity. Um, I've got a good relationship over there and speak with the dean. I go through everything. We've got the video. We all take a look at the video. End result, dean looks at the school resource officer and says, you know, I know this young boy. He's not violent. He's never in trouble. He's a great student. He's headed to college. I think the counselor's right. I I think this is okay. Let's see what the parents think. We got the other parents in. They took a look at everything. They had it all explained. It got dropped. It was over. Without counsel, this would have gone forward into the criminal justice system. You have to be there immediately. You've got to be there from the start. I have a question, though. Yeah. If it happened at the mall, why is the school involved at all? Anytime that there is any violent incident involving a student in their school, they're involved. And And I could understand on school grounds, but when you're off on your own time, that's a parent-to-parent issue, I would think. Like, parents... Should be parents, no? Not in this day and age. Oh. So, you know, as I say, we're seeing a lot of school bullying cases. You need an attorney. And for most parents, they would take a look at it and say, all right, I got to go see the dean in the morning. You know, I'm not going to spend $2,500 this morning to try and hire a lawyer to have them come down. Maybe we won't need them. Well, by the time you find that, yes, you do need them, it's too, it's too late. And now it's much harder to end it. So you want to be in there quickly. Um, another example, um, we had a, a client who, a uh, member who discharged his firearm. I was there 14 minutes after the shot was fired. I got there essentially the same time that PD did. He's cruising. Yep. <laughs> Were you running lights and siren too? <laughs> I have them. I wasn't I using them. <laughs> No, blue lights only when toned in the fire department. Thank you very much. However, 
Um, the, but you need to be there. Um, when it happens at 3 o'clock in the morning, I just had one at 3 a.m., and you go over to the phone book and you dial a typical criminal law firm. Um, thank you for calling our voicemail. We will be monitoring our messages. We will get back to you uh, within the week. Um, there are attorneys who do pick up, but it's not a lot, and it's not real fast in many cases. Um, I am, in fact, at least for members, on call 24-7. If you call me up to find out who's going to win the baseball game the next day at 3 a.m., you can deal with my wife. I will, I will just say to everybody, just, so that, just to back up what he's saying, I accidentally butt-dialed him at 1.30 in the morning. And he called me back within 15 minutes. And I was like, I am so sorry. I didn't mean to wake you up. <laughs> but he does call back. I wasn't I wasn't going to mention this. <laughs> Fortunately, she had the video turned off. <laughs> yes. There. But it it's a reality. The gangs are getting more and more aggressive. Their technology is getting really good in how to break in. Many of the gangs are now recruiting people who are former military who are training them. Um 20 years ago, when we saw violence with the gangs, it was, it was almost comical. I mean, we made fun of these people holding the guns over their head and holding it sideways. <laughs> the whole gangster thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's not anymore. Today, many of these guys are very proficient with firearms. They had an uh, incident, I think it was up in Glastonbury, where a homeowner heard something in their driveway. They had no idea what it was. They walked outside, just turned on the lights, and some juvenile opened fire on them, fired multiple rounds into the house. This is madness. In Glastonbury? Oh. I, be I believe it was. Yeah, do you know? No, I, I didn't hear that. I, I believe it was. And shortly thereafter, um, Sergeant John Cavana was elected in town, and I don't think there's been any more shootings in his town. <laughs> there is a new sheriff. Well, Middletown oh. just had SWAT shot and down, I don't know which block, I can't remember, I saw it on the news. I was like, oh. Yeah, busy. I just, I pay attention to Southington. It's where my tax dollars go, so. I know. You know, uh, it's. I mean, we have fun here, don't don't worry, right over in this yeah. plaza over here. Two guys, about two months ago, pretty clear yeah. footage actually, were arrested, uh, one of them had a Glock switch. Yeah. Full auto. Yeah, and uh, 50 bags of fentanyl. They didn't just know that case. was illegal. The fentanyl, the Glock switch, or the serial numbers they obliterated on the Glock 19. All of them. They didn't read the law. Damn. Was he a very nice boy? Yeah, he I'm was. sure he was. They probably had pictures of him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, a very, very famous incident a few years ago that created rioting, and they had this picture of this, this lovely man there who had been shot and killed by the police. And the, I saw the original photograph and the news media had photoshopped out all of his gang texts. Mm hmm Huh. You know, really, guys? Mm hmm True. But it's, that's what happens here. Um, it's very hard on the police officers. Uh, in many jurisdictions, no one's got their back. So when things start to happen, they're going to stand down. On the other hand, if they've got a law-abiding person who's not going to hurt them, and they can come on in and build up their rec mm -hmm. records on it. Chief's going to be all happy. Guess what? We're it. Mm -hmm. We're easy pickings. You know, what, one final thing that I think we probably ought to, you know, mention here um, is that if you're interacting with the police, you've dialed 911, you're interacting with them, uh, you want to say very little. Another criminal attorney I know here in Connecticut has got a business card, and all it says on the back is stop talking. <laughs> in, in my classes, I tell people that I'm going to get new business cards made up, and it's going to have my firm name, Miller Law Group, on the front, and then on the back of it's going to have a piece of duct tape. <laughs> and my instructions to them is if you discharge your firearm, remove and the duct tape, tape and put it over your mouth. <laughs> yep. Tell them your name. 
give them your driver's license, give them your pistol permit, you know, it's just fine. Be done. <laughs> you need to be done. You need you to know, say, listen, I want, I want to wait until my lawyer's present. I and, bet you could get somebody to make custom duct tape for you. This is like Miller Law Group on it. <laughs> you just hand out a roll of duct tape with every business card. I'll bet you Lock and Load could probably get that as a product. I could buy it down here. I, I could give them the exclusive on it. Ooh. Miller Law Group. It just Mouth needs baby, tape. baby yeah. rolls. It doesn't even Yeah, have the to little pay. ones. Just a little yeah. tiny. Yeah. You know, We're, it's time to look into. Yep. So here we have it. There we go. But it's, you know, we have an old adage in the law. No one talks. Everyone walks. Thanks, Russ. <laughs> so it just, but unfortunately, if you're involved in an incident, as the adrenaline flows into your system, you will have just an absolute irresistible urge to tell your story. It's very hard not to, and it's very important that you don't. And different organizations have slightly different interpretations of just what you should say, but in general, it shouldn't be too much. What's going to happen, I will get down there, or whoever your attorney is is going to get down there, We will speak to law enforcement because in many, many cases, the only evidence they will have against you is what you said. Just the other night, my my client uh, had three people break into his barn. He's in a rural area. His wife comes in yelling, they're breaking into our barn. They're breaking into our barn. He runs outside. It's middle of the night. He's got a big flashlight. He's got his pistol. And as he shines the flashlight, three men run out. One points a pistol at him. He fires one shot. Doesn't hit him. The guys run off. They get into their truck. They go screaming off into the night. They're gone. Uh, truck's not on cameras. There's no camera of the gun being pointed at him. It's middle of night. Just nothing covers down there by the garage. Um, And he dials 911. Police show up. He's like, three men just broke into my garage. They they were in there. They pointed a gun at me. I said, did you discharge a gun? Yes, sir, I did. You're under arrest, unlawful discharge. Self-defense is an affirmative defense. You raise it at trial as a defense to the crime of unlawful discharge, manslaughter, assault, go on down the list. As a result, if you call the police, there is a significant probability that you will be arrested. Now, when counsel gets there, we'll get this sorted out, and the system tends to do the right thing. But my guy would not have been arrested if he called the police and said there were three guys, broke into my barn, one of them pointed a gun at me. Period. Sir, did you discharge your firearm? I don't want to make any further statement until my, my counsel is present. No bullet holes, no witness, nothing. He wouldn't have gotten arrested. There was no case. And over and over and over again, I had another one out in a farm country where my uh, – Client's grandfather was assaulted by a friend of a family member with a crack cocaine problem. Guy comes at granddad with a shovel. Grandson takes a shotgun, fires one shot into the air. Guy drops the shovel and runs. That's what Joe Biden told him to do. Yep. (laughs) They call the police. The police come over. They arrest him for assault. They go and speak to the crack addict who says, he tried to kill me. He tried to shoot me with the shotgun. And I get in front of the state's attorney, and the state's attorney says, the man had a shovel, which is a deadly weapon, by the way. It would be self-defense, imminent threat, great bodily harm. would be okay, but state's attorney says, he had a shovel. Your guy had a shotgun. He shot at him. He tried to kill him. I said, my guy fired one shot in the air. State's attorney says, how do you prove that? I said, how many holes are in the other guy? He's like, none. I say, he's a farm kid. You think at 50 feet he missed with a shotgun? (laughs) They dropped it. (laughs) But I hope some of this is is useful out there. These are kind of some general tips of things. Um, 
when we teach courses, when the other groups teach courses, you know, we do hours of this stuff and Mm -hmm. we go into great more depth, but I, I hope, you know, this will help. Um, you know, people can reach out to us. It's just call millerlaw.com. And, um, you know, my telephone number's on there. I prefer that you call me rather than just try to email in through the site. Strangely, uh, if I can't take it, I'll tell you to text me and you can always text the number that's up on the site. That works really well. So yeah. feel free. God bless you all. And I hope to never see any of you in a courtroom. <laughs> we got one question sure. um, that we got on Facebook here. Um, <clears throat> and so the question, the, the general question was, how do I set up a family trust so that your children that all possess permits can inherit your firearms? That was the quote unquote sure. question. Now the, the issue here has changed greatly over the last couple of years. Uh, at the moment, if it is a so-called assault weapon, 2023 or otherwise, uh, at the moment they will not allow you to transfer it into a trust. Uh, and their position on it seems to be that for a firearm to be transferred, um, the transferee must have a pistol permit. And because a trust doesn't have a permit, they will put the name of the trust on, but they do it, they treat it as being an individual. So they don't really, from the state police standpoint, recognize the trust. However, the advantage to a trust is that upon your death, normally the probate court would decide how your guns are distributed. If the guns are in a trust, the trust doesn't end upon your death. As such, the probate court has no jurisdiction. Right. Okay. And then it just gets distributed per the rules of the trust. We don't need a court. We don't need a judge. Uh, we had one judge tell us no one needs to own an assault weapon. I am not going to sign off a piece of paper that transfers an assault weapon to anybody. I don't care what the state law says. That's the problem. So as to guns that we can transfer into trusts, if they may be problems for transfer, trusts are still useful. However, um, any firearm lawfully owned may be transferred with or without a trust on your death. Uh, They will issue an assault weapon certificate. What happens is that whoever files for probate, executor, executrix, administrator, administratrix, depending on whether you have a will or not, um, what happens is they provide a copy of their appointment, typically a form called a PC-450, to the state police. The state police will then recognize that same person just like the owner of the firearms. If it is not clear in your will who gets the guns, they sometimes will require a statement from the probate court uh, certifying who the proper beneficiary is. And once that's identified, uh, then there's, uh, there's no charge on it, and they will uh, allow guns to be passed by testamentary disposition under a will or under the laws of intestacy if you don't have a will. Okay. I have one other question built off of that. Um, suppressors in a trust. Yes, Good idea, bad idea, and do you set those up? Yes and yes. Um, The Whether a suppressor is in a trust or not, there is no $200 tax upon transfer. Typically, when a uh, suppressor is transferred, it's done on an ATF Form 4 with a $200 tax. Mm -hmm. Upon your death, uh, and this includes if it's after your death coming out of a trust, same rule, Uh, You use a Form 5. It's a tax-free transfer. So once again, it keeps the probate court out of it. The federal government is fine with trusts. So generally, I prefer that suppressors are in trusts. But either way, it can be transferred. Okay. Interesting. All right. And then I have one question also that was given to us by um, one of our listeners And it was, he goes, I have a question regarding farmers protecting their livestock livestock slash animals. Is one allowed to use deadly force slash a firearm to protect farm animals from wild animals 
If there is no town laws about discharge of a firearm, could I protect my farm animals? Okay. The, the first thing that we need to clarify, when we talk about deadly <clears throat> force, that is force which creates a substantial risk of death to persons. Okay. Wild animals are not persons. So the standard for the use of force is lower against wild animals than it is against persons. Essentially, the standard that we have here is that you cannot do it in a manner that poses an unreasonable risk to persons. So if you are in the middle of downtown Waterbury and a black cat pet crosses your path and you pull out an Uzi, you know, and put 120 rounds into the poor animal... Mm-hmm. Um, they're probably going to find that was excessive, especially if you took out 20 store windows, you know, and they had to close down 10 square blocks. You know, obviously an absurd, you know, example. But let's assume that you are in farm country. And um, so you're, you're out there, you're in farm country. We just had this case. Um, my client built a very, very strong chicken coop. I call it a chicken fortress. <laughs> um, it looked a lot like the walls of Jericho when the bear came stumbling in. <laughs> this thing was built out of like two by sixes oh. and heavy plywood. The bear tore it to toothpicks, just ripped it apart, went inside, and began killing all of my client's chickens. My client fired a shot into the air. The next door neighbor heard the shot, didn't know what it was, and called the police. Police showed up and said, did you discharge your firearm? He said, yes, I did. I fired it in the air. They arrested him for unlawful discharge. Now, under Connecticut law, there's a new law as of October 1 this year, um, where bears attack animals, domestic animals, you may shoot the bear. It's one of the few examples where you can shoot a bear. Generally, farmers have a right to protect their livestock, always have. So the general rule here is, yes, you may use firearms to protect your livestock if you can do so in a manner that does not cause an unreasonable risk to persons. Okay. And that would cover not just bear, but like coyote, any kind of bobcat, any of that, fox, any of that, if they're hassling the livestock, correct? You'd have to show that there was actual damage to livestock. Mm -hmm. Um, Our hunting laws do have, you know, we do cover hunting of coyotes, um, other wild animals that are out there. So generally the hunting laws apply. But if you are raising livestock and the animal is in the act of killing your livestock, then as a rule, if you can do so without causing unreasonable damage, you know, harm to others, then yes, you can use your firearms. Thank you. All right. Um, I think that's about it for today's episode. Um, I want to thank attorney Greg Miller for coming on. Website is callmillerlaw.com and phone number is 203-733-2887. Correct. um, Which you can also text. Yes. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I lost my train of thought on that one. Um, I appreciate you coming on, taking the time. Um, I know you have some more legal seminars coming up at multiple fishing games, I think over the next couple weeks. Yeah, I'll be at Rockville. I will be, um, at, uh, Niantic. I'm going to be at Fairfield Fish and Game. I'm going to be at Wallingford. I was, uh, just over at Pawchog the other night. Uh, we talk usually, out there through U.S. Law Shield, usually one to two nights in the month. At the moment, we're doing more just to try and get people up to speed on the uh, on this new assault weapons registration. But I love having people come down on the courses. It just, I'd much rather teach people because what I'm doing is I'm training the trainer. You guys are the trainers out there. If I can teach you, because most guys who come to the courses are the more more experienced people. They'll get out there, they'll teach other, we'll spread the word, and good sportsmen don't end up under arrest. That's right, we all help each other. Sounds good. 
Well, thank you, Greg, for coming on to our podcast. My name's Josh. I'm Michelle. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Good night.